so I am going to get started. So as Victoria mentioned, this talk is, bu is about the archives, but um, I also wanted to let you know just a few of the things that we have going on here in case you haven't had a chance yet to come to the site. So we're in Brookline, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. This is Frederick Law Olmsted's former home and office. In the photo, you can see the grounds and the side of the house and the landscape in its full glory. Um, as the National Park Service, part of our mission is, and I'm quoting right now, to preserve unimpaired the natural and cultural resources and values of the national park system for the enjoyment, education, and inspiration of this and future generations. So let me tell you a bit about how we do that here. We run a number of interpreted programs at the site designed to reach varied audiences. Our open season is from April to November, and over that time, we offer free tours of the landscape and historic offices to visitors. We also hold programs offsite, including the ranger-led walking tours of the Olmsted landscapes in the Boston area, and you can see that in the photo here. Um, we um, conduct lectures to community groups, such as garden clubs and libraries. We table at local events. We also work with youth through running an Olmsted educational program with Brookline third grade classes and through the National Park Service Junior Ranger Program. We maintain the site's archives and historic objects, well, which I'll get into a bit more, um, and we facilitate archival research. Um, we also maintain the site's physical structures and the Olmsted design grounds, which showcase many of the same features as his parks. So if you're ever in the Boston area and you'd like to visit, please reach out to us. Even if it's not during our open season, we can accommodate public tours and we'd love to have you here. So this talk is focused on the archives, but to just help ground the discussion, I'm going to talk a bit about the timeline of the um, Olmsted firms in Brookline. So Frederick Law Olmsted began working from his new home, which he called Fairstead in Brookline in 1883. He collaborated with several different partners, including his son, John Charles Olmsted, and he retired in 1898. And after he moved in, he worked on the grounds here. Um, so it is sort of a signature piece of his landscape philosophy and almost like a mini park that has, as I mentioned, a lot of the same features as his larger parks. After he retired in 1898, his sons, John Charles and Fred Jr., who had been training at the firm and landscape architecture, took on full leadership of the business and renamed it Olmsted Brothers. As Olmsted Brothers, the firm increased business operations in terms of commissions, staff, and physical space, building an additional office wing onto the house. John, Char John Charles passed away in 1920, and the firm continued under Fred Jr. until his retirement in 1949. Artemis Richardson and Joe Hudak were principals at the tail end of Olmsted Brothers and led the next iteration of the firm, whose name was officially changed to Olmsted Associates in 1961. Staff and projects decreased significantly over the 1960s and 70s, and Richardson eventually made the decision to sell the physical building, grounds, and archives to the National Park Service in 1979. The National Park Service worked to transform Fairstead from a working office and residence to the research repository and interpretive museum that it is today. And you can see Jay, our superintendent, in this little thumbnail <laughs> picture, um, so some of you may have met him before as well. So with that said, we all know there have been many, many people involved in the successes of the Olmsted firms over the years. Likewise, there have been many National Park Service employees, contractors, interns, partners, and others who have made this National Historic Site what it is today. Oops. So this group shows a photograph of Olmsted Brothers employees, and this is in 1900. And you can notice that in the names below, there are a few missing. So part of our job here is to continue to dig and uncover some of the missing pieces in the history here. And we're able to do that through the interpretive staff that works here and is constantly finding out more information about the firm. And then also the research, the outside researchers who um, continue to look. And, and through all of that, we're still learning new things all the time, though um, unfortunately we'll never know anything, but we're always working on it. Okay, so now let me tell you about the archives. The Olmsted Archives house more than 1 million historic documents created between 1839 and 1980. There are materials that relate to about 6,000 design projects the firm worked on. Our records contain over 139,000 landscape architectural plans and drawings. 
There are 70,000 sheets of planting lists related to the firm's jobs. There are 60,000 photographic prints, including photo albums for landscape architecture jobs, photographs of the Olmsted family, and photos of the family's international travels. We have administrative and business records for the firms, employee records, published reports, historic herbariums collected by Olmsted Sr. and John Charles, and catalogs, periodicals, and books related to landscape architecture and gardening. In addition to our archival records, we also have many historic objects that are owned by the firm, including 3D models created in the on-site model shop, office furniture, material samples such as tiles that the firm used to make design decisions, hockey sticks used by Olmsted employees recreationally, and much, much more. I'd like to show you a few more items from some of our most used collections so you can see a bit more about what re resources we have available. So the largest and most widely used collection at the Olmsted site is the Plants and Drawings collection. Items from this collection date back to 1859 when Frederick Law Olmsted was working on his first landscape design project, Central Park. They span until the last days of the Olmsted Associates firm in 1979. The plans are widely varied in design, size, materials, and purpose. Many of them are extremely large. Um, one of our staff members scanned a plan that was 32 feet long, so that can just give you a sense of what we're working with here. Um, they may include technical and engineering information, planting lists and layouts, topographical maps, and artistic renderings of proposed designs. They often include handwritten notes and calculations done by firm employees. Um, I even came across a little cartoon on the back of a plan once, so you never really know what you're going to find. Uh, one project may have produced only one plan or over a thousand plans. People access this collection for a wide variety of reasons, including academic research and historic landscape restoration. There is so much variety within this collection, so I'm going to show you a few more plans just to give you more of a sense. The firm's plans and drawings cover many aspects of landscape project design. As you can see, this set of plans deals with layout and would have acted as a guide for the structure and groundwork of a landscape. These plans were mostly used internally by the firm, and sometimes they were mailed out to clients with an explanation of the work. So on the left, you can see a 1909 flower garden layout for the grounds of the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. To the top right is a blueprint that shows the grading of a Brookline Parkway in 1890. And then on the bottom right is a general development plan of the Rice Library in Kittery, Maine. And that plan is from 1976. So this is just a few years before Olmsted Associates, Olmsted Associates stopped their operations here. Um, and so you can kind of see over time how the plan styles change. There are still some commonalities even at the end of the firm, but um, yeah, they changed over different management from Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. to Olmsted Brothers and then to Olmsted Associates. The firm's plans and drawings include much more than park layouts and plantings. Each of the plans here comes from the Olmsted Brothers era and shows a shift in style that occurred following Olmsted Sr.'s time. Olmsted Sr.'s landscape philosophy opposed non-natural elements in the landscape as he felt that the landscape should exist as a whole without attention-grabbing elements such as statues. As Olmsted Brothers' firm grew in times of types and volume of commissions, so too did the requests that the firm chose to accommodate. They began to incorporate more non-organic elements into their landscape designs. Draftsmen were often tasked with designing these features, as we see here. I love these types of plans because I think they show the artistic side of the draftsman in a different way. Um, so here you can see on the left is a lamppost and sign for a Kentucky distillery. In the middle is a sundial for a private estate, and it was for something called the Love Temple, so I'm not sure <laughs> what that is. Um, but we do have many really cool designs of sundials, so that's something that I like to dive more into at some point. And then on the right, there is the Pop Memorial in New Orleans. Perspective drawings in the Olmsted collection are effective in showing the vision of an Olmsted design. Artistic renderings were part of many projects to show clients what could be if the Olmsted firm was hired for a job and to help firm members envision the outcome they were working towards. These drawings use a variety of mediums, including watercolors, pencil, and ink. They are polished to varying degrees depending on whether they were used internally or presented to clients. 
They also showcased the artistic talent of the draftsmen. Part of their training was to hone these skills so they could effectively communicate designs to someone outside of the landscape um, architecture profession. So I just wanted to put a face to some of these drawings. Uh, this is a watercolor that was created by Leon Henry Zach. And the information I've read about him focuses more on his aptitude at management. He was often tasked with handling the firm's high profile clients. Um, he worked at the Olmsted firm for 20 years before taking a job in the U.S. Army's Division of Engineering and Military Construction. So I haven't met, found much information about his artistic skills, but we do have this um, watercolor that he painted when he was 26 years old during his first year at the firm. This is actually in his employee file, and it's not attached to a particular um, project. So I'm not sure if this was done um, just for his personal enjoyment or practice, but you can just see that there was a lot of talent at the firm, and this is one way that it was expressed. The firm used photography to track the progress, pro uh, sorry, progress of a project before, during, and after its completion. Project photos also helped Olmsted employees keep track and continue to work on assignments when they were in different physical locations. This photograph is a prospect park, and this is in 1921. So this is an Olmsted senior design, and the photo is actually from decades after he finished that work. So you can see that the, the um, park is being used in the way that Olmsted intended it to be. It's an oasis in the city, away from all the tall buildings. It's a gathering space for people to come together and just kind of escape the rigor of um, city life. We also have several family photo albums at the Olmsteads collected over the years. Many of the photographs were taken here at Fairstead. These document the lives of various members of the Olmsted family. Above left is a photograph from the 1880s where you can see Olmsted Sears children, Marion and Fred Jr. So this is Marion and this is Fred Jr. And then on the right, you can see Fred Jr.'s daughter, Margaret in, uh, I'm sorry, daughter Charlotte in 1914. The Olmsted family traveled extensively for both personal and professional reasons. Our European photo collection documents their travels throughout Europe, as well as at other locations such as Algeria, Japan, and Cuba. The Olmsted family took inspiration in the international landscapes they visited and used these photos as a reference for projects they took on in the States. Olmsted Sr.'s daughter Marion was a talented photographer and artist. She often traveled with her father and brothers and took many of the photographs on their trips. The photos here are from Japan, France, England, Germany, and Algeria. You can see the note below this um, photo in the corner. And this is a fence in Germany. And underneath it says fence of round bars, a good deal used, but not very satisfactory in appearance. So sometimes it wasn't a source of inspiration, but just a caution of what not to do. Correspondence generated by Frederick Law Olmsted and the Olmsted firms is held at several different repositories, including ours. Art Richardson, the head of Olmsted Associates, donated the, donated the majority of Olmsted Sr. and the Olmsted Brothers correspondence to the Library of Congress. The John Charles Olmsted papers are held at the Harvard Graduate School of Design in Cambridge. The largest correspondence collection from our site is the post-1949 correspondence, and that covers the period after Fred Jr.'s retirement um, and into Olmsted Associates. We also have correspondence from Olmsted Brothers field offices in California and New York and the papers of Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. We just finished fully digitizing the California and Western office correspondence. So the letter on this slide is from the Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. collection. And I really love this collection. Um, we Most of the records we have are related to business, but this gets a little bit more personal. Um, there is a letter from Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. to his son. There are also many letters from his mother, Mary Perkins Olmsted, and this is one of them. Um, so it kind of just gives you a slice of their lives. So this was written from the Olmsted property Felstead in Deer Isle, Maine, and um, Mary Perkins Olmsted is just sort of telling Fred Jr. about her comings and goings and the way that um, her daily concerns, and it um, kind of showcases their relationship a bit. 
Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about storage and you can see here, this is a photograph of our offsite storage facility in Springfield, Massachusetts. I wish I wasn't in this photo, but um, you can see how excited I am about storage here. Um, and I just wanna point out and give a shout out to the Springfield Armory because this building is very cool. Um, so you can see above there's a tin ceiling and then on the ground there are some, lines, some painted lines and that's because the armory worker use this space as a basketball court. Um, so storage is a constant conversation at many National Park Service sites. Um, space constraints and facilities play a huge role in these decisions. So the majority of our plans, correspondence, and photographs are stored at the Olmsted site in Brookline in the vault in mobile shelving. But due to the size of our collections and the volume of historic objects, which are sometimes pretty large, it's impossible for us to store everything on site here in Brookline. So to solve this problem, we developed a long-term storage agreement with the Springfield Armory National Historic Site in Springfield, Massachusetts. And um, they have more space than us, so it just worked out that they had the space to hold everything. And we've maintained that relationship for a long time. I want to tell you a bit more about the vault that we have here at Fairstead, and that is used for most of our on-site storage. The vault was built by Olmsted Brothers between 1902 and 1912. It is three stories high and was originally connected by a staircase. Olmsted Brothers installed security measures for the vault via a metal combination lock, metal fireproof doors, and a connection to the office fire detection system. The photo on the left shows the vault's condition when the National Park Service came in in 1979. The organization system there had been used since the vault was built. Um, so you can kind of see how things work in here. Basically, there were wooden compartments in the vault, and each um, compartment was designated for a project. Um, each project was given a project number, and then each plan was also giving, given an identification number. So uh, working together, those two numbers created um, a number that was just for that plan. So we actually still use that system that was put in place by Olmsted Brothers. And then um, when they were done with the plan, they would basically roll the plan up and then place it into this cubby hole. So all this to say, the Olmsted firm spent money, time, resources, and much thought into how they cared for their plans. One of the National Park Service's missions in the early years at Fairstead was to figure out how to store the archives in a way that was safe for them to be maintained and accessed. They concluded that the best way to store the plans was to modernize the vault space with archival updates such as flat storage and climate control. These adjustments have made it possible for us to use the vault in the same way it was intended while keeping materials safe and stable for the long term. So you can see on the photo to the right, that is the same area of the vault, but that's what it looks like now. So we do have these flat storage shelves and then up here for plans that are too large to fit in those shelves, we have them rolled onto our archival grade rolls. So that will keep them protected. I want to mention Harry Perkins as well, who was um, an employee at Olmsted Brothers, and I consider him to be the first archivist at the site. And you can see him right here. He's sitting um, in the front to the right. So he was hired as a plans clerk at Olmsted Brothers in 1901 at the age of 22, and he stayed here for 50 years. He also met his wife, Dorothy, there while she was working in the clerical department. He was stationed at a built-in desk right outside of the vault and anyone who wanted to access a plan had to go through him. This strict approach ensured that plans would not be misplaced and everything was returned to the vault. However, this may have been unpopular with other office employees as you can see a crowd waiting outside of the vault in this cartoon. So it may not have been the fastest way but it kept everything accounted for. I often think of Harry Perkins when I'm going in and out of the vault to retrieve plans, and I strive to take my responsibilities to the plans as seriously as he did. His longevity at the site is also important. The Olmsted site seems to have some special power in keeping employees here for a really long time. So some of my NPS colleagues here now have been at the site for 20 or 30 or even 40 years. Um, so if I end up in those ranks as well, I know I'm in good company with all of my colleagues and also Harry Perkins here. 
When the National Park Service came into the site in 1979, it was clear that the plans and archives needed a lot of attention. They created a plan to focus on preservation, organization, and documentation efforts over the next decade to make sure the collections were stabilized and accounted for. Though necessary, this was a complicated decision as research at the site had already been happening for years before the National Park Service arrived. In the 1960s and 70s, during the U.S. environmental movement, there was a renewed interest in Frederick Law Olmsted Sr., and researchers began to increasingly reach out to Olmsted Associates to access plans. So the administrative staff here at the firm had been actually fielding those requests and um, providing researchers with access to the plans, sometimes on site, sometimes the researcher may even take the plan off site and return them to us afterwards. When the National Park Service came in in 1979 with trained archival staff, it was clear in assessing the condition of the collections that major preservation work was needed um, and to ensure the plans were stable and the records were safe for handling. So the National Park Service decided the best long-term strategy was to focus on conservation efforts rather than research access for that time, um, just to ensure that the research process would run more smoothly once this um, plan was carried out and plans would also be protected. Conservation labs were set up both here at Fairstead and at the Springfield Armory National Historic Site. Technicians were tasked with preserving the plans and drawings collections and preparing them for flat storage shelving. Humidification methods were used to flatten the rolled plans, which were sometimes extremely brittle, having been tightly rolled in the fluctuating temperatures of the vault for decades. Plans were also cleaned as needed and tears were repaired if it was possible. Plans that were too large for flat shelving were placed on the archival grade rolls and the rest were placed in acid free folders and eventually moved to the flat storage shelving in the vault and also the storage that we have in Springfield Armory. The National Park Service had the advantage that the Olmsted firms had been organized in the vault, but there was still a lot to be done in terms of organizing and documenting the archival records and historic objects. Collections were assessed, processed, and rehoused in acid-free folders and boxes. Finding aids were written to provide historical context and to guide researchers in locating what they needed. The plans and drawings and other collections were labeled and inventoried. Their locations were recorded so that staff could easily locate them. Historic objects were cataloged first on paper and later in an online database. This all helped the National Park Service staff gain intellectual control over the collections and objects so they could better assist the public in accessing these resources. The work of the Olmsted curatorial team over the years has gotten the collection to a place where it is safely preserved, stored, and accounted for. The next major phase of our work and one which we are currently in is the digitization of our collections. Digitization helps us achieve two major goals. One, it creates much greater public access to our resources. At this point, we have digitized over 90% of the plans and drawings collections, 100% of the job photographs and European photographs, and made major dents in other collections as well. Instead of traveling to our site in Brookline, an in individual can access high quality digital images of these collections from anywhere in the world. Second, digitization minimizes the handling of historic items. The goal is that once an item is digitized by trained curatorial staff, it will then be returned to its folder, roll, or manuscript box and remain there. So wear and tear from repeated handling over time is largely diminished. The Olmsted site has continued to receive donations to, to our collection since the Park Service purchased the site in 1979. We're always grateful to be able to add another piece to our historic record. Each accession has its own backstory of how the item eventually came or often returned to the Olmsted site. These are a few of the accessions we've received in the past few years. To the left is an undated blueprint created by Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. This blueprint was not um, associated with a specific landscape design project, but appears to be Olmsted re Olmsted's rendering of the ideal layout of a residential property. In the center, you can see a portable drafting table that belonged to a prominent draftsman in Olmsted Brothers, Percival Gallagher. 
Gallagher likely brought this table to different job sites, so he was able to work on drawings and plans from the actual landscape rather than the office. Last, I would like to show you a short silent film that was taken by John Charles Olmsted's daughter, Margaret, in 1929. A few years back, we received a donation of 22 films that had been found in the attic of a property once owned by John Charles. The films were in rough shape and obviously dated technology, but we sent them out to a conservator to be digitized and they are now all available online. These are all black and white silent films of a few minutes each, most of which show scenes from Deer Isle, Maine, where the Olmsteads had properties. These have opened our eyes to another aspect of the Olmsted family history and have cleared the way for more research avenues. So let me just pull this up. Um, this film is from 1929, and this is, let me just, sorry, I'm just um, sharing my screen. Okay, so this is from 1929, and this was taken by Margaret. So you're going to see just some seaside scenes. You'll see Margaret and her sister Carolyn. Um, and I'll play this just for a few minutes so you can get a sense of what this resource is like. Oh. Okay, so that should give you just a little sense of what kind of videos we have available. Um, you could see Margaret running across the rocks in her heels, which um, I don't think I would be brave enough to try. Um, but yeah, these are a really great resource and they're fun to look through if you ever feel inclined. Okay, um, and I wanted to talk about our relationships with some visitors to the site. We try to maintain connections to um, people who worked at Olmsted Associates, as well as um, people who are descendants of the Olmsted family. And then we're also in touch with other people who have connections to Olmsted. Um, so on the left, you can see Mary Tynan, who is a secretary and receptionist at Olmsted Associates. 
Um, she had been contacted for an oral history interview in 2015 and came in and was really generous in answering some of our questions um, about her time working at Olmsted Associates. She also ended up when she left with some um, papers and also some objects related to the Olmsted so story that she was really generous to actually donate back to us. Um, so we've been in touch with her over the years and have a pretty good connection and she's been very supportive of our work here. And then to the right, you can see um, these are some of the Olmsted descendants. So Jane Gill is over here on the right. And um, she is the granddaughter of Fred Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. and the great granddaughter, obviously, of Olmsted Sr. So we've been in touch with her over the years as well, and also some of her siblings. She was all actually really helpful when we got the um, films of Margaret Olmsteads because she kind of remembered meeting Margaret and her sister Carolyn um, and had been to their dear Isle property. So she had firsthand knowledge of what they were like and was able to fill that in a bit for us. She also did an oral history interview about her memories of Fred Jr. Um, and her connection to the Olmsted family. And so in 2022, she actually came back to the site with her niece, Patty, who's here in the black and Patty's family. So they all live in California and just came to the site to check it out. I think she had been here as a child, um, but hadn't been back since. And um, so it was really fun to host them and just kind of see the next generation of Olmsted descendants and how interested they were in that legacy. Some of, some of our staff members actually thought her son right here kind of resembled Fred Jr., which I think I can see a bit. Um, but we try to maintain those connections just to keep them strong. And it, I think it's value, valuable both personally and professionally to maintain that. Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about how you can access all of these resources now. Um, it kind of, we have sort of a few different websites that work together to get you those resources. I think the plan in the long term will be to have a search database where everything's linked up. But for now, what we're working with is a search database. Then we post all of our plans and photographs on Flickr. The Library of Congress, as I mentioned before, has most of the Olmsted correspondence. So our search database, Orgo, actually lists all of that as well. Um, and then my colleague, Anthony Reed, created a GIS-based map of Olmsted projects. So I can just go through really briefly and um, walk you through how to use those. There are more tutorials available online if you're ever interested in learning more, um, but it can be a, li a little bit tricky in the beginning. If you ever have questions, also feel free to reach out to me or to the, um, uh, the archive staff here in general, and we can kind of walk you through things. Okay, so this is Orgo. Um, I think the best way I would recommend starting a search, if you have a keyword of location or of a draftsman or anything, if you have a vague sense of what you're looking for, you could type it in here. So I'm just looking for plans in Seattle. And then from there, you can see what is available, what projects we have related to Seattle. The job number is going to be really important for you to take note of. If you see that, it just helps kind of streamline things. So let's say I want to look at Ravenna Park. Um, one other thing to note is the job numbers are always five digits, even if the plan might be like the job number might be three or four digits. You just want to tack on the zeros in the beginning. So I'm going to do... and then go back to the archival search, put in the job number here. And again, you can use this for keywords as well. It doesn't have to be job number, but I found that that is usually the most, e the easiest way to get here. And then when I, oh, so this one actually only has one thing, um, but this is correspondence. So this is probably at the Library of Congress. And yeah, but you can see here, so it kind of gives you some more information. So with that, it will help you to find this resource at the Library of Congress's online uh, database. And let me just show you another that I know has more information.
Okay, so this is for the Back Bay Fens in Boston. Uh, this was actually part of that emerald necklace, so there's going to be a lot. So it looks like three, uh, 309 records, and that's correspondence as well as the plans. So the correspondence will always be listed first. And then you'll see the plans here. You also might see planting lists here, um, photographs. And um, so if you cl click on this, you'll see more information about this plan. So it has all the metadata here. It has the dimensions, uh, what you can expect to see for the plan, the dates, um, any notes that, about the plan. And so if you wanted to then go and find the image of this plan, what we, you would need to do is go to Flickr. So. I'm in a photo album right now, but let me get back to um, the main Flickr page. Okay, so for here, um, it's all organized by job number again. So if you know what job number you're looking for, you can just scroll through and find it here. The photograph albums are here as well. And then we also have the plans. Um, so if you are wanting to kind of expedite things, say you have a job number that's very high up and you don't want to scroll through everything, you could go to the photo stream. And here, this is just plans are added in um, as we scan them. And so right now you're just seeing the newest plans that have been added. There isn't a real order here. So I would type in what I'm looking for and make sure that you're in the photo stream search. Cause if you search up here, you're just searching all of Flickr. So you really could see anything there. So I usually just search the job number and then click on a plan and then click on the album. And then you could kind of scroll through and find the plan that you're looking for from Orgo. Um, the Library of Congress, this is their homepage. You have a lot of information here about the collection. They also have finding aids, um, Olmsted Associates records. So that's actually all of the Olmsted Brothers records as well. And those are organized by job. Um, so if you're looking for correspondence, just kind of go through here, um, look around, and Orgo obviously will help if you're looking for a specific letter. This is the GIS map that Anthony created. So you can see it's um, just in North America. Uh, the Olm Olmstead had done a few jobs that were like in the Caribbean and a few different places as well. So those will also show up here. This isn't a final version. We're still adding stuff in here, but you can, um, it's really helpful. Like if you know you're looking for plans in California, you can just zoom in and then click on these dots and see what we have. Um, if you have Google Maps, this will actually link you to Flickr, to the images as well, which I don't have on this computer, but I would recommend if you're going to be using this a lot. And the, um, the projects are color coded based on if they're in a state or a park or something else. Um, so this is a really cool resource to check out. And then this is just our homepage for the archives, and this is on the um, Olmsted National Park Service website. This is a good place to start if you're just not sure exactly what you're looking for. You can get another description of what we have here, and then also um, you can see the finding aids, and you can get a link to Orgo. So if you're not sure where to start, I think this is probably the place to go. Um, yeah, and that's basically it. So I have a list of resources just at that in the last slide of the presentation. I can also send these to Victoria if it's helpful um, because, yeah, I, I'm not expecting anybody to, to like jot all of this down. So yeah, this is the resource list. Oops. I'll send it to Victoria and um, I think that would just be easier anyway, rather than you trying to write everything down, but that will link you to all the resources I just shared and um, help you get started if you're looking for something. So that's it. Thank you so much. And again, if you're ever in the area, please let us know. We'd love to host you at the site. Great. Thank you so much, Katie. That was wonderful.
Um, and we, we will, we'll follow up with an email that has resources. Um, and if anyone has any questions for Katie, I think we have a couple minutes here that we could do like a, a little Q and A session. And then we have one more resource for you guys that we'll share. Question, um, at, at the Harvard Symposium during the 2022 year, um, Charles Birnbaum, he mentioned that, you know, the role of, of the, of women in the Olmsted firm was really under documented. And, um, uh, he mentioned Marion and also Mary per Perkins. I think there's even a book about Mary Perkins and also, you know, like the, the auto Sally Audubon, you know, that these women were really parts of their, at that era parts of their husband's work they just were under um appreciated or under documented so i'm i'm just wondering what um yeah what's your observation about about the women that were, were you know part of the olmstead family and and if there were anyone who who weren't part of the family that actually worked in the firm yeah. Um, so I agree. I think it's very underdocumented. Marion, especially since she was sort of involved in going on their trips to Europe. And to, we have some of her photos that are actually credited as her. But for the most part, I don't think she is credited for assisting with the work. I know that she had been in Biltmore as well, working with them. Um, and kind of that was sort of like during Frederick Olmsted Sr.'s decline. And so she was really helpful with that and just sort of helping to manage the project there. Um, Mary Perkins Olmstead, we have a few photos of her, but yeah, and then her letters obviously kind of help give some insight into what she was like. Um, but there is a lot more to be done. And then that's part of why we're looking into Margaret and Carolyn Olmstead, who are John Charles, John Charles's daughters. Um, Margaret was the one who took those films, and then also Charlotte Olmstead, um, who is Fred Jr.'s daughter. So we're still digging around, and it's something that we would like to learn more about. Um, and then in terms of the firm that you know, that's another kind of complicating answer. Um, most of the women who worked at the firm worked in the clerical department. So we have some information and they were, you know, obviously really important in just helping run the firm and getting things done. Um, but they weren't usually elevated to the position of draftsman. When before they had been hiring women in the clerical wing, there were some men who would start in that job and then they would be able to get promotions and be more responsible for drafting and things like that. But that didn't really happen for women. Um, and then recently we found out that there was actually a female draftsman that worked at Olmsted Associates and this was in the 50s. Um, yeah, and so she was only there for a few months and it seemed like she wasn't really getting as much work and then eventually was let go. So that's another unfortunate story, but we're all, always looking into these. Um, and Lauren just put in the chat, Stella Ope supported Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. That's true, she was his assistant and she traveled with him. Um, she had a really important role in his life and was there for years and years. And then Helen Bullard was another who worked in the clerical wing um, and she was really important in just advocating for the clerical workers and she was also you know she's in some of the cartoons that the firm created she was another big presence at the site and one other question was the perkins the archivist the gentleman was he related to mary perkins hey not to my knowledge no and then lauren says again beatrix Warren visited the office early in her career and wrote notes on how the office functioned from a business perspective. That's really interesting. I haven't heard about that. So I'll definitely look into that as well. Great. Um, Katie, thank you so much. This really has been um, so interesting. I'm going to turn it over to Mark. He has, um, well, I'll let him tell you, but Mark, do you want to? Sure. Um, a couple of years ago in 2018, I did a um, a panoramic tour of uh, Fairstead. I'm putting the link into the chat. Um, and I just thought I'd, I'd give you a quick uh, uh, look at what I did. And it's something available for you if you, you're interested in Fairstead and uh, learning a little bit more about it. Uh, 
Can you see my screen? Yes. Yep, we can. Okay, thanks. Um, so anyway, here, this is, uh, um, I did this with, with Alan Banks, who was one of the, the previous superintendents. Uh, he let me in and showed me around, but um, this is uh, a beautiful day in July, uh, and you can come into the tour and see the front gate. Uh, and this is just, um, you know, VR. it's like a VR tour. It is a VR tour, and you can look around. Uh, and travel all through the the grounds and see the the building from a bunch of different locations. Uh, and spread throughout, there are little uh, uh, pop-ups that ex explain a lot of what what uh, Katie was explaining in her presentation. But this just gives you an overview of uh, the property, and you can get a really good sense of how it it in many ways reflects Olmsted's design principles. And uh, you have a little ramble back here, very little ramble, but it's uh, a nice rock garden you can view. And uh, when I was out there photographing, uh, these turkeys wandered right through the property uh, to give you a sense of just how uh, inviting it is. But um, uh, I've taken a bunch of these tours. Uh, more of them are going to appear on the site, but I also have uh, done um, uh, World's End uh, out in Bar Boston Harbor near Hull. Uh, and I just like to capture the properties to give a sense of what they look like now, very much like the Olmsteads did uh, when they were working on their projects. Uh, and I just offer them up on my site, Panorambles, uh, as a free way to view the sites. And uh, if you, you're not local to them, I find it a useful tool. But yeah, um, that's a basic overview of, of what I've got. And I welcome everybody to go take a look and uh, poke around. Great. Thanks so much, Mark. That um, It is a fun, I haven't been personally, um, and so it's a fun way for me to get to see, see the site. Um, Jill, I see you dropped a, a great video in the, the chat box of women in the Olmsted firm. Um, oh, actually, I don't think I've seen it, so I'm going to save that so I can watch it. It's a short video that one of um, our interns <clears throat> um, did a couple of years back with some of our ranger staff, and it, it really is just a sort of a short overview of the women in the firm. And um, one thing I wanted to add that Katie's been really instrumental in um, is identifying objects in our collection that are not currently on display, but we're working toward um, doing a historic and yet display um you know, recreation of one of the offices in the clerical ring, wing, which isn't really interpreted as far as the offices go, really just sort of as a path to the design office, but um, really starting to um, add the role and the story of the women of, in the firm um, into our daily uh, design office tours. So um, more to come, we're hoping to have that installed um, next fiscal year in 2025. Very cool, very much welcome. Well, great. Unless anyone has anything else, um, we can we can sneak out a few minutes early. But we really appreciate you coming out, Katie, Jill, Lauren, all of you. We ex appreciate your expertise um, here as well. It's been a really interesting presentation. Thank you so much.